Hello, hi and greetings everyone. This is Dilip. I think you can uh, hear what I am saying right now. So, is the streaming good? Going? Let me check. Can you hear? Yeah, hi. Can you hear what I'm trying to say? Okay, so hearing is not an issue. Cool. So that's why I want to check it once. Okay. So hope you're all doing good. So we are starting with uh, lupus today. So that's our topic to be, uh, which I promised yesterday. So sorry, you know, like yesterday there was a small problem in the, uh, you know, like the display capture and all these things. So that is why I removed my uh, you know, like image as of now to make the interface much better. So we'll be figuring out that soon. So don't worry about it. But today we'll be discussing only on the subject and only with my audio and only what I'm going to write. So hope at least this will not have any much uh, technical issues today. So we hope we'll resolve that uh, within a couple of days so that the next YouTube session will be much better. Okay. So anyways, you are not seeing any audio video lag, right? So is anyone looking on any audio video lag? No. So you don't have any audio video lags. So everything is fine. Yeah, cool. So that's what I want. So that's the reason why I uh, uh, shifted to this kind of format only for today. So anyways, we don't, we won't be having any audio video lag today for now. Anyways, let us start with the session today. Today's session is going to be on uh, SLE. So lupus erythematosus. Anyways, fine. This is the first case which I'm going to discuss. A 56-year-old patient with a history of systemic lupus erythematosus is admitted to the hospital for lethargy, hematuria, and acute kidney injury. Imaging has demonstrated a normal-sized kidney with a parenchymal disease. The patient's urinalysis showed red blood cell cast with protein of 3.5 mg per deciliter. Biopsy showed that the patient is having a uh, systemic lupus erythematum. I mean, uh, the biopsy showed class 4 diffuse lupus nephritis in an SLE case. What is the next step in the management? Whether you start with intravenous methylprednisolone or you are going to start with azathioprine or you are going to start with prednisolone with cyclophosphate or you are going to start with reduximab. So what are you going to do here? So in this particular perspective. So what is going to be your answer? Okay, some of you are telling that uh, one answer I got from Shukam Gupta that this is the answer they have marked already. So is there any other answers that you want to tell? Any other answer? C. Okay. So some students have gone for C as the answer. Prednisolone and cyclophosphamide. So Sneha has got it B, that is azathioprine. And Pranavi has gone for the option C again. So no one uh, for option number D? Really? Okay, so now Shusti also has gone for C. So Rajendran has gone for D. So which means it's a very good question in the sense like which means all four options have been addressed and all four options have been sensed right now. So we have we are very clear that this is going to be a very interesting one for the exams. So because in you know, like if every student has gone for at least one single option, then it means that the question is good. That's what it means. Anyways, fine. So let us see what is going to be the answer. The answer in this perspective is going to be the prednisolone and uh, cyclophosphamide. So remember, we are discussing with something called a class 4 lupus nephritis. So we'll be discussing about lupus nephritis in detail in some time. I'll be telling in a nutshell of what we're going to uh, see in the different uh, 
stages of lupus nephritis, different class of lupus nephritis. But we are seeing a class 4. Class 4 is something, one of the very severe forms and non-treating class 4 lupus nephritis promptly might result in complete loss of the kidneys uh, in a short span of time. And the patient might even die of uremia and uh, severe metabolic acidosis. So we have to start uh, the treatment urgently and on an urgent basis we give a dual therapy. We don't uh, really start with the monotherapy. So that's why prednisolone and cyclophosphamide is the one that is preferred in the setting of a class 4 lupus nephritis which we will be discussing subsequently and monotherapy either only with intravenous methylprednisolone or only with azathioprine is not recommended. So azathioprine can be used for maintenance therapy but we don't really use azathioprine as a monotherapy. Similarly intravenous methylprednisolone along with cyclophosphamide could be a right answer but intravenous methylprednisolone alone could not be a right answer. And uh, rituximab on the other hand, is also approved in the treatment of uh, lupus nephritis, especially class 4 lupus nephritis, but rituximab alone uh, can be a treatment only after the patient is not tolerating the prednisolone plus cyclophosphamide or if the patient has some contraindications to use cyclophosphamide. Can anyone tell what could be the probable contraindication for use of cyclophosphamide? Anyone? So that... Uh, where you prefer rituximab. Very, very common scenario from the exam perspective. So, anyone who can tell which is one of the common contraindications to use cyclophosphate in a... I mean, I'll give a clue. So, usually, uh, bone marrow suppression, cystitis, Shubham Gupta is telling. See, actually what you are telling is the side effects. What you people are actually telling are the side effects of cyclophosphamide. Uh, side effects of cyclophosphamide and contraindications are not the same. Side effects of cyclophosphamide include, uh, like what you said, hemorrhagic cystitis is fine, which you generally uh, prevent to a great extent by giving something called a mesna, or you are telling something called a bone marrow suppression, which is also a side effect. That's fine. So you get uh, future because I mean there is a risk of increased risk of future myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia as well. So okay fine. So whatever you are telling right now are actually side effects of cyclophosphamide. That's all right. But I'm asking about a contraindication for cyclophosphamide. What is the contraindication for probable cyclophosphamide use? So I, I'm telling a clue that is also a side effect, but that is seen in uh, more um, preferentially in younger individuals. And that becomes a problem in the younger individuals. Can anyone tell? So one side effect you have missed, which is what is going to be the probable relative contraindication. Anyone? Hypersity reaction? No, not at all. Not Devamara, not hypersity reaction. I would prefer telling something called a gonadotoxicity. Gonadotoxicity, you know, like, I mean, patient with MDS, you know, like, that's a good guess, but a uh, patient who is having an MDS will be usually having a very old age, most of the times. I mean, you have a childhood MDS as well, but uh, the older age is what is uh, going to be uh, where you're going to get the minor dysplastic from. Anyways, the gonadotoxicity is going to be the most important. Suppose if you're going to give cyclophosphamide to a younger individual, it's going to be a younger individual and who preserves, uh, who, I mean, wishes to preserve his or her fertility, and in that perspective, you can go for rituximab. So they don't want any suppression of the gonads or don't want any toxicity on the gonads by using cyclophosphamide, especially if the patient does not wish to do so, then in that setting, you can uh, start preferring a rituximab in that perspective, So which is really, really important. So that's one of the important relative contraindications for the use of cyclophosphamide. Apart from that, uh, you know, like uh, use of cyclophosphamide may not be good for certain group of people, especially patient who has experienced the previous immunosuppression, previous serious uh, infections due to immunosuppressions. We don't really prefer cyclophosphamide or rituximab. It's a costly alternative, but still it's a very good alternative. Anyways, fine. So with this background, let us move on to the other features of systemic lupus erythematosus so that uh, you'll be easily understanding about that. So we know the epidemiology of systemic lupus erythematosus is what we are going to see first. As far as the epidemiology is concerned, we know it's going to be extremely common in the setting of a female uh, where the overall uh, male-female ratio, female-male ratio is approximately around uh, 9 to 10 is to 1. So which is uh, pretty you know, like important in the setting of SLE. And if you ask the most common age group, of development of SLE is going to be somewhere around 16 to 55 years of age group. So 
what you can observe from this particular 16 to 55 years of age group is the fact that this is basically the reproductive age group. So which means there is some relationship with the hormones. There is, is there any relationship with the hormones? You can really assume one thing that the patient is having the disease at maximum peak during the reproductive age group and at the same time it is seen predominantly in females during the reproductive age group which means that's why I'm going to tell that probably estrogen is going to have some role. We don't know how estrogen really uh, affects the development of SLE or affects the pathophysiology of SLE but uh, still estrogen is considered to be one of the very important associations with development of systemic lupus erythematosus and that's been proven with uh, multiple studies as well where they have clearly proven that estrogen administration in a patient with SLE can flare up SLE and at the same time um, uh, patients who are receiving hormone replacement therapy who are in remission of SLE can develop a relapse of SLE as well. So that's why estrogen is really, really important. And apart from the epidemiology, there is some interesting association with the age of the patient. For example, if the patient is a pediatric age group before the reproductive uh, age group, so in incidence of SLE is approximately only 20 percentage is the incidence of SLE. But if you take the female male ratio, in a patient who is having less than 16 years of age, it's uh, going to be approximately around uh, 8 is to 1. But if you take in the 16 to 55 years mark, incidence is very, very high. Almost 65 percentage of the SLE cases will be in the middle age only, like in the reproductive age group, 16 to 55 years of age, where the male-female ratio is approximately 10 to 15 is to 1, where it's predominates typically in the females. Once the disease happens in old age, beyond 55 years of age, which is still possible and it's the least uh, incidence in this age group, like 15 percentage only, where the male-female ratio, female-male ratio is only 2 is to 1. So what really tells you the fact is again, during the reproductive age group is the one that female-male ratio is going to be very significant. But once you uh, cross that reproductive age group and you enter your adult life, your female-male ratio is not going to be that significant and it's going to be only around. Uh, 2 is to 1. So, which means that time the female-female ratio will not be that significant in that uh, setting. So, after this uh, understanding of epidemiology, if you not go into the pathophysiology, so I think I put the marker. So, pathophysiology of systemic lupus erythematosus. So, as far as, far as the pathophysiology of systemic lupus erythematosus is concerned, uh, the current idea is very simple as I told you in multiple previous videos to develop an autoimmune disease. For example, to develop an autoimmune disease like SLE, you need to have a genetic background and uh, you need to have an environmental background. So dear Shubham, the data, what I, whatever I'm giving is actually uh, from the Kelly and uh, Abad's rheumatology. So we are only following this from the Kelly's rheumatology. So Kelly's rheumatology clearly tells that the, one of the studies that told about the incidence of children is approximately 7 to 8 is to 1, which means you are talking about only the reproductive age group. Once you cross that reproductive age group only, your ratio is going to be a little different. Anyways, fine. So there are a lot of genetic relationships are there. So for example, probably some HLA polymorphisms are there. So for like uh, you have HLA DR2, you have HLA DR3, you have HLA DR4 and you have HLA DR8. So there are a lot of uh, speculations with the association with these uh, HLA polymorphisms, but still none of them have been concretely proven of which you know that DR4 is also strongly associated with rheumatoid arthritis. But anyways, so all these things have been speculated, but none of, been, none of these have been concretely proven. And apart from that, you have the TREX gene mutations. So clinically, uh, not very important, but uh, very important for exams, the TREX1, in fact, the TREX1 gene mutations and the early complement deficiency. Sometimes the patient may have a genetic deficiency of the complement. So whenever you have an early complement deficiency, especially the C1Q deficiency is going to be the most important and uh, probably the C4 and C2. So when you take the C1Q, C4 and C2, all these complements have one common thing between them. So can you ever tell what is the common thing between these uh, three complements? What's going to the common thing between these three complements? So one common thing that you're going to encounter with these three complements is the fact all these are classical complement pathways. That's why when you take your microbiology textbook and you see uh, the early complement uh, deficiency, especially from the classical complement pathway, so you can clearly see that uh, all these are 
uh, you know like going to be involved in development of systemic lupus erythematosus so deficiencies can be associated with systemic lupus erythematosus all right then uh, apart from that uh, we have the interferon pathway genes interferon alpha pathway genes i'll tell you why this is important because interferon alpha is supposed to be uh, one of the most important you know like uh, and a signature cytokine as far as SLE is concerned so which we'll be discussing in some time maybe in another five minutes so interferon alpha pathway genes are really really important for the development of SLE and their mutations like you have IRF5, STAT4, IRAC1, then TLR7 of which the TLR7 is going to be the most important the interferon alpha pathway genes are going to play a very important and significant role then we have the PTPN22 gene and PTPN22 is going to be the most important because this PTPN22 polymorphisms can be associated with many other autoimmune disorders including type 1 diabetes mellitus, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and even uh, your vitiligo and of course in SLE as well which is the basic of all autoimmune disorders. And uh, genes that are involved in immune complex clearing like your FC gamma receptor 2A then FC gamma receptor 3B, C-reactive protein, integrin alpha, uh, M and all this uh, stuff are also associated with the development of systemic lupus erythematosus but I don't want to really write and confuse you but it's very important to know at least these points which I have mentioned uh, here of which the TREX one is going to be the most important as far as exams are concerned and early complement deficiencies especially they might be asking you in microbiology exams. Apart from that we have some environmental relationships as well and uh, there are certain viruses which have a strong environmental role very importantly your Epstein-Barr virus which is going to be the most important and apart from that we have uh, certain drugs which can play a very very important role we know there are certain drugs which can pro cause a similar picture like of SLE called as drug induced lupus erythematosus so drugs causing uh, SLE is very important which we will be discussing later on and apart from that there is enough evidence from UV light as a very important trigger because UV light uh, I mean has been said to you know like uh, accentuate the development of SLE or probably you know like uh, most of the skin lesions in SLE are basically photosensitive where UV light exposure may result in severe flare up of the skin uh, problems in patients with SLE so that's why UV light is going to be really really important thought to be a very important association with systemic lupus erythematis and finally there is something called a silica dust that also has been proven to be uh, playing a very important role in the development of SLE apart from that you have vitamin D deficiency has been proven but probably vitamin D deficiency has been thought to be uh, provoking the risk of developing SLE as well as many other autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis as well but anyways none of this have been concretely proven but apart from this the strongest genetic association is with the Epstein-Barr virus only that's how that's why it is really really important the strongest genetic association is with SLE okay all right I don't know why this thing is coming okay okay all right okay then then uh, based on this uh, genetic and environmental markers you are actually developing a disease autoimmune disorder called SLE and this is the outline for any autoimmune disorder in the world so even for rheumatoid arthritis you can give a similar outline even for Jogren syndrome you can give a similar outline you, even for uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis you can give a similar outline for any other autoimmune disorder you can give a similar outline where you have to have a basic genetic background and added on to that you will be having some um, environmental influence coupled with that you are going to develop an autoimmune disease but more than that you have some existential risk factors so what are the existential risk factors the most important existential risk factor as far as SLE is concerned which is uh, something which cannot be changed is the hormone influence which means born as females that itself is going to give you a risk factor for development of SLE <coughs> so where histone is going to be the most important so which we have clearly proven after some time so this is one of the important existential risk factors as far as SLE is concerned so after knowing so much about uh, how we really you know like go about uh, having a, you know like initial pathophysiology of SLE let's just go for the actual pathophysiology of how really SLE happens so this is something really really tough but I'll try to simplify as much as possible so whenever you have a cell in the body uh, there are some environmental influences let me shade in a different color maybe so you have some environmental influences 
let me go to that so you have some environmental influences so once you have this kind of uh, environmental influences they are going to produce increased apoptosis so let us see uh, for example a uv light or could be certain virus which can result in development of apoptosis so naturally and normally this kind of apoptosis is extremely common so this is not something that is uh, inappropriate or uncommon so you are really going to have some element of apoptosis going on so normally so this apoptotic material will be cleared appropriately so basically so it's not like it won't be cleared it will be cleared normally but in a patient with sle so this apoptosis is generally created by this environmental crisis but the clearance of apoptotic material is also going to be the most important that's where the problem is with sre patient this is where the uh, genetic influence comes into play so because the clearance of the apoptotic material is based on complemented pathways the complement pathways are really really important especially the classical complement pathways are really really important uh, for the clearance of this apoptotic material out of the system the dead material the, out of the system so if the clearance of the apoptotic material is defective so if this is not happening properly so we know so sle is going to have defects in the classical complement pathways and they are having going to have defects in multiple um, you know like your immunological mechanisms which i told you already in the genetic makeup so there can be a defective clearance of apoptotic material and this is going to be the key feature for the development of sle so how the clearance of uh, i mean defective clearance of apoptotic material is going to create an issue so let us see so once this apoptotic material is not cleared properly they are going to accumulate basically of course so and these uh, you know like accumulated apoptotic material which are not cleared they are going to attract inflammatory cells it's like a dead rat in your house so it's going to generate an inflammation in the area so because they are going to attract the inflammatory cells for example if there is a dead rat and you have removed it as soon as possible nobody is going to notice but if you are going to keep the dead rat in your house for days together of course uh, it will start uh, getting rot and you will get that bad smell and uh, people even from the next house will start complaining that there is something wrong and they will try to come and clean it up so that's what really happens here so the inflammation happens the inflammatory cells come here and they produce an inflammation and this type of inflammation uh, and the clearance of apoptotic cells by inflammation is what we refer to as snacks so these are called as secondary uh, necrotic cell derived material so basically speaking your apoptosis should not i mean produce any inflammation that's the basic difference between an apoptosis and necrosis necrosis generally will produce an inflammation but apoptosis will not create an inflammation uh, if apoptosis creates inflammation that is really really bad and these are nothing but uh, snacks that are formed as a result of poor clearance of this segments and uh, this is what we refer to as a uh, secondary necrotic cell derived material so that's the basic idea behind that so once you have produced that uh, secondary necrotic cell derived material so this is going to serve as an antigen for the inflammatory cells so if you ask me one question if you ask me one question so what this uh, uh, secondary necrotic cell derived material is actually made of they are made of your cell components for example they are made of the nuclear material they are made of the cytoplasmic material so once your uh, i mean your inflammation is triggered against this uh, necrotic cell derived material that is the nuclear material as well as the cytoplasmic material and this is the basis of development of uh, antibodies in sle so antibodies in the sense you develop this anti nuclear antibodies for example and you develop antibodies against the cytoplasmic component in the setting of an anka probably so anyway somehow you are going to generate these antibodies or so once you generate these uh, antibodies uh, that's uh, they are going to produce more apoptosis because they are going to cause more damage so once they produce more apoptosis you are going to result in more accumulation of this snacks once more snacks accumulate they are going to attract more inflammation more inflammation more antibodies more antibodies more apoptosis more damage and this vicious cycle will continue unless and until you break it up so that's how you develop and there are you know like lot of uh, you know like small points that you have to note uh, before development of this uh, you know like inflammatory reaction for example 
uh, you know, like it's not just the snacks are going to uh, create this amount of inflammation. There should be some intrinsic dysregulation within the immune system where they're going to recognize these snacks as antigens and they're going to develop a immune response. So what is the dysregulation of the immune system is coming from? So the dysregulation of the immune system is going to come from uh, two types of cells, of course, from the dendritic cells and the most important dendritic cells as far as the systemic lupus erythematosus is concerned is the plasma site or dendritic cells that's going to be the most important. If you see really, so there are two types of dendritic cells. One is going to be the myeloid dendritic cells. Second one is the plasma site or dendritic cells. Of course, plasma site or dendritic cells is going to be the most important as far as SL is concerned because they are going to produce something called the interferon alpha, which is thought to be the storehouse of uh, problems in the setting of SLE and this is a signature cytokine as far as SLEs are concerned and the myeloid dendritic cells are also important in the setting of SLE but uh, it is nothing less compared to that of the plasma serot dendritic cells. Plasma serot dendritic cells are going to be the most important. Apart from that there are dysfunctional T cells and B cells also in the setting of SLE and where they are going to recognize this uh, SNEKs as antigens and they are going to develop an inappropriate immune response and you are going to produce uh, you know, like this antibodies against uh, the body's self antigens. And apart from that, you have the myeloid dendritic cells as well, which are the counterpart of plasma cell dendritic cells, but still they are important, but not a very big role in the setting of SLE. But myeloid dendritic cells uh, secrete something called uh, two important components, that is bliss and April, which we'll be discussing subsequently, because uh, currently we have this bliss inhibitors in the form of belimumab. So, and this is the basis of our uh, targeted therapy right now. But anyways, fine. We have Bliss, April and all this stuff. So which are the ones that actually maintain the B cells. So the survival of the B cells in many situations and especially in the setting of a systemic lupus erythematosus typically depends on the Bliss and the April generation by the myeloid dendritic cells which produce a survival of the B cells and these B cells are the ones that are going to generate this antibodies we are talking about. So that's why previously we had a lot of non-selective therapy which means there are therapies which diffusely inhibited the immune system like uh, we had uh, isathioprine, we had uh, cyclophosphamide, we have many other uh, non-targeted drugs previously. Currently we are in the era of targeted drugs. So what do you mean by targeted drugs? So for that, for that matters you can target uh, interferon alpha straight away. We have certain drugs which we'll be discussing after some time or we can directly target bliss straight away so we have uh, certain bliss inhibitors or we can target the b cells directly in the form of rituximab so we have a lot of targeted therapy right now so that's why understanding the pathophysiology is very important even though you know like pathophysiology is quite 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 complicated so i've tried to explain this pathophysiology in a much 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 simpler way as possible fine so once you have known the pathophysiology sufficiently. So this is the basic overlay because the pathophysiology of SLE alone can be discussed for uh, more than 2-3 hours. So that's not going to be the goal here. We are going to discuss the uh, clinical features more importantly. That's going to be the most important. Clear? So if at all, if you want to know what are the uh, doll like receptors that are very very important in the setting of SLE. If they ask you the most important signature cytokine in the setting of SLE, I would answer it is interferon alpha, the most important cytokine as far as SLE is concerned. It's going to be the reason for most of the problems in systemic lupus erythematosus. Then um, in the dendritic cells, what dendritic cell is very very important? The plasma cytoid or myeloid dendritic cell, of course, I'll go for the plasma cytoid dendritic cells, which are the ones that are going to produce the interferon alpha, which is going to be the most important as far as uh, SLE is concerned. And in the plasma cytoid dendritic cells, we have two toll like receptors. One is the TLR7 and the TLR9, which are going to be the uh, most important. So because these are the two TLRs that recognize this uh, SNEKs, that is secondary necrotic cell derivative material as antigens and that's how they produce the immune response. So the TLR7 and 9 are going to be the most important in the pathophysiology of SLE. And apart from that, you have, uh, you know, like B cell survival factors. The B cells are also important, the B cell survival factors. The most important B cell survival factor that is important for the survival and proliferation of the B cells in the setting of SLE uh, that produce antibody antibodies is the bliss. So we are having the bliss inhibitors as well. Apart from this, we have another mechanism called as NET. 
So everyone know what you mean by net. We are talking about the neutrophilic extracellular traps and probably this has thought to be uh, recently playing a very, very important role in the setting of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. You know, neutrophils basically have three different types of killing mechanisms. Initially, we know only two uh, type of killing mechanism. The first type of killing mechanism is phagocytosis. Uh, second type of uh, killing mechanism is the uh, release of chemical minutes. That is what we refer to as degranulation. So this is the second type of killing material. And of course, the third type which came recently in the last one decade is the netosis. That is uh, neutrophilic extracellular traps. We know that which is one of the very, very important uh, killing mechanism for neutrophils. We know how nets work, you know, like they are nothing but a nuclear and cytoplasmic material which is released as a meshwork like you can remember like a spider uh, web which is worn around uh, the local area so that whatever pathogens that move in that area you will get trapped in that kind of a net which will be consumed by uh, another neutrophil. Remember, uh, once the netosis is formed, the neutrophil will die and the nets can be formed either by a living neutrophil or even by a dead neutrophil doesn't matter but anyways once the net is formed the neutrophil most probably will die and which will act as a trap for the organisms so that the other neutrophils can come in that area the, and uh, engulf those trapped organisms so netosis is a very very important mechanism so basically you see what you mean by netosis netosis means you are actually releasing the nuclear and cytoplasmic material nuclear and the cytoplasmic material into the local area to form a web that actually basically traps the uh, organisms in that area to be consumed by the other neutrophils. But that you can understand is going to be the problem in the setting of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus because uh, this nuclear and cytoplasmic material that are produced during netosis are have to be cleared by the complements or are to be cleared by the complements or by uh, some other mechanism which for which as I mean certain genes play a very very important role. Suppose if you have a problem in the clearing of these nets, you are going to increase the accumulation of the nuclear and cytoplasmic material caused during this netosis, which is going to further uh, trigger the inflammatory response in the local area where this nuclear and cytoplasmic material that is released during netosis will form a snake once again that is secondary necrotic cell derived material against which your uh, antibodies can be formed and more surprisingly this netosis and the formation of nets can be actually accentuated by interferon alpha interferon alpha so it's basically like kind of a vicious cycle where you can clearly see that uh, initially there will be due to some environmental factors which i told you already like some probably uh, viral infection or probably due to some environmental factors the amount of nets that will be produced will be increased once the amount of nets that are produced is increased uh, uh, because the basic defect in SLE patients there will be defective clearance by uh, the immune system. Once the clearance is going to be defective, uh, this is going to, going to get accumulated and this will be sensed by the immune system which is going to produce interferon alpha. Interferon alpha in turn is going to increase the production of nets. This nets cannot be cleared once again due to uh, the underlying genetic issue and uh, once this uh, Nets are not cleared, they will form snakes. Snakes will trigger the immune system. Immune system will produce more interferon alpha, more interferon alpha, more nets. And this is going to act like a vicious cycle as we saw already. So this is a very, very important pathophysiology. And the evidence uh, is the fact that certain SLE patients have this ANCAs. So you have the C ANCA and P ANCA. One of the important uh, uh, areas where you can develop this C ANCA and P ANCA is the SLE as well. You would have studied in your patho I mean pathology textbooks itself. Anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies. So that's the evidence that NETS is going to play a very, very important role in the development of SLE and the certain antibodies in SLE. So of course, now we know that uh, what is the pathophysiology in a nutshell. I told you about the genetic background. I told you about the environmental uh, influence. I told you about the existential factors. And I've told you about the actual pathophysiology that is happening in the setting of SLE. So once you know the pathophysiology properly, then we can move on to the clinical features in SLE. So clinical features in SLE, previously we used to give by uh, a very important uh, mnemonic called as MD soap brain, which is also the previous uh, ACR criteria for the development of SLE or uh, for the diagnosis of SLE. 
so you know what what m stands for m basically stands for the mala rash and d classically stands for the discoid rash but even though the acr 1987 and i'm sorry acr 1997 criteria is no longer followed we follow the uh, slick criteria right now but anyways this will be very very useful for our understanding basically and s stands for cirrhositis pleuritis pericarditis it can cause chest pain and uh, Cirrhositis, then A is going to stand for arthritis, and O is going to stand for something called as a um, oral ulcers. Clear? And A is going to stand for something called arthritis, and P is going to stand for something called photosensitivity, and B is going to stand for something called blood or hematological features r is going to stand for something called renal features and a is going to stand for ana positivity and i is going to stand for something called other immunological features so we have not only ana positivity we have uh, other uh, immunological criteria for the diagnosis of sle like you have anti smith anti dsdna and a lot of other stuff are there and n is going to stand for the neurological features in SLE. So we are going to see each and everything in a great uh, depth and detail right now. So that's why I wrote that first. So we have MD, so brain, malaria, discarded, cirrhosis, oral ulcers, arthritis, photosensitivity, uh, blood involvement, renal involvement, uh, ANA positivity, other immunological problems and uh, neurological involvement. So that is going to be the mnemonic for the 1997 ACR criteria for systemic lupus erythematosus. Even though we don't use it now, this is going to be very, very helpful for us to understand the clinical features of systemic lupus erythematosus. And as for the clinical features are concerned, first we'll start with the constitutional symptoms, which are extremely common in the setting of SLE. So in fact, the constitutional symptoms are going to be the most common feature of systemic lupus erythematosus, where the most common constitutional symptom, if somebody asks you, I'll be telling it's fatigue. Fatigue is going to be the most common constitutional symptom of all. And apart from that, the patient might have fever. Uh, usually, it will be a low-grade fever, not a high-grade fever. The patient might have myalgia. The patient might have weight loss. And sometimes, even there can be weight gain due to edema caused by renal failure. But usually, they can go for weight loss in early stages, myalgia, fever. And they can even produce lymph adenopathy as a constitutional symptom. If they ask you, the lymph adenopathy is... Uh, if they ask you the lymph, if the if the lymph adenopathy is regional or generalized, uh, it's more regional, and most of the time the nodes generally tend to be non-tender in the setting of a systemic lupus erythematosus. Then we are going going on to the moving on to the musculoskeletal involvement, or we just call it as an MSK involvement. Uh, musculoskeletal involvement, on the other hand, is uh, supposed to be the most common systemic feature of SLE. If you ask the systems. In SLE, which is most commonly involved, it's going to be the musculoskeletal system. That's the one that's most commonly affected in the setting of systemic lupus erythematosus. And uh, especially the joint involvement is going to be really, really involved. The muscle involvement is, oh, is going to happen in SLE, but it's quite rare in the form of myositis. But the joint involvement is the one that's going to be very typical and very, 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 very common systemic involvement in the setting of systemic lupus erythematosus. So what are the joint involvement you might get? You might get arthritis or just an arthralgia and remember uh, fatigue is something that is seen in almost 95 to 100 percentage of the cases which means it's the most common feature of sle whereas arthritis and arthralgia is typically seen in more than 90 percentage of the sle patients which means fatigue and arthralgia are going to be your most common and prominent initial features of systemic lupus erythematosus. Most of the times you tend to miss out because nobody is going to evaluate a mild arthralgia extensively unless and until it is uh, present for more than a few weeks, especially for more than six or eight weeks. You're not going to, I mean, really evaluate for that. So anyways, so these the two are going to be the most common symptoms in the setting of systemic lupus erythematosus. And typically, what are the features of arthritis? This arthritis is supposed to be non-erosive. And we have some erosive forms of arthritis as well. But uh, for exam's sake and for God's sake, for e in exams, please don't answer. It's an erosive arthritis. One of the important types of non-erosive arthritis is SLE. In exams, whenever they ask you about non-erosive arthritis, you have to answer only two things. One is SLE, second is rheumatic fever. So both are typically and classically non-erosive arthritis. 
and can they produce deformities what is your answer i mean in rheumatoid arthritis we see a lot of deformities like uh, there's a zero positive arthritis then rheumatoid arthritis is a zero positive arthritis which produces a lot of deformities like uh, your uh, z deformity of the tongue thumb or you have the botanier deformity swan neck deformity and a lot of deformities you see in rheumatoid arthritis do you see deformities in the setting so that's what my question is so what's going to be your answer Will that be any deformities? Really? Yes, Megan is telling yes, the deformities may be there in the setting of SLE. And is there anyone who wants to tell the answer? Niharika is also telling the answer is yes. And yes, deformities can happen in the setting of SLE. So rheumatoid arthritis is a type of an erosive arthritis, whereas uh, deformities are common. But you do see deformities in SLE as well. So what, why you, why you want to see as, I mean, if if the lesions are non-erosive, the arthritis is basically non-erosive. So why you should see the deformities really? Pravin is asking whether arthritis is unilateral or bilateral. It's bilateral. Typically, bilateral is going to be symmetric most of the times. Now they have reverted back to their answers. No. <laughs> but actually speaking, the deformities are seen. So if you ask why the deformities are seen in the setting of SLE, remember, even in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis, the deformities are not due to the erosions. The deformities in rheumatoid arthritis and SLE are basically due to a phenomenon called tenosynovitis. Tenosynovitis is the one that's going to result in deformities, basically, not the erosions. Erosions play a part, but uh, tenosynovitis are going to be the most important, which can happen in any seropositive arthritis. Remember, SLE is also seropositive arthritis where you have ANA positivity and uh, rheumatoid arthritis is also a seropositive arthritis where you can have a rheumatoid factor positivity or a ACPA positivity, so which I have discussed already. So anyways, fine. So you can have deformities, which means what are the kind of deformities that you can have? The same deformities that you see in rheumatoid arthritis, the same swan neck deformity, the same botanic deformity, the same uh, Z thumb all these things can happen in the setting of systemic globus erythematosus as well. And if you get the deformities in SLE, that's called by a special name called as Jacquard's arthritis. And of course, now there will be a lot of confusion. So how to differentiate between a Jacquard's arthritis from a rheumatoid arthritis. So remember, of course, uh, from your investigations, Jacquard's arthritis will be more of ANA positivity. Rheumatoid arthritis will be more of a rheumatoid factor positivity and ACPA positivity and where rheumatoid arthritis patients tend to be ANA negative, not always, whereas uh, Jacquard's arthritis patients tend to be mostly rheumatoid factor negative and remember don't take it uh, in a very, very, you know, like strict sense, lot of uh, SLE patients may also can have rheumatoid factor positivity because rheumatoid factor is going to be a very non-specific antibody and not a very specific one. And apart from uh, this, from a clinical standpoint, uh, or from an X-ray standpoint, from imaging standpoint, we know Jacquard's arthritis is going to be non-erosive. Whereas rheumatoid arthritis is a classic erosive type of arthritis. Whenever you have a rheumatoid factor positivity, it tells you that the patient will have erosions. So these antibodies, rheumatoid factor positive, I mean rheumatoid factor and ACPA are going to tell you one more idea that that will be a erosive arthritis. So erosions are classical feature. You don't see erosions. And of, of course, you know, like in Jacquard's arthritis, most of the time we will see uh, no pain. So it will be painless, whereas rheumatoid arthritis generally tends to be extremely painful. Clear? So the deformities associated with Jacquard's arthritis are painless and deformities associated with rheumatoid arthritis are going to be painful. This is how you are going to differentiate between a Jacquard's arthritis versus a rheumatoid arthritis in the first place. So apart from the joint in, I mean, uh, arthralgia and arthritis, you can have this synovial effusions, which are possible in the setting of SLE, but uh, they won't be usually huge effusions as uh, what you see in uh, other patients with zero positive arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, but they generally tend to have smaller effusions. All right. So clinically myositis, so we talked about the joint, what about the muscle? Myositis can happen in the setting of SLE, but uh, generally not that common. It's very rare. The clinical myositis is basically very rare. And then we are moving on to the mucocutaneous involvement. Mucocutaneous involvement in SLE. 
uh, mucoidus involvement basically as well as you talk about you're talking about the skin the hair and the appendages of course the alopecia is going to be the most important as far as sle is concerned and most of the times it's going to be non scarring type of alopecia which is really really important and most of the time the reason for this non scarring type of alope alopecia is going to be the telogen effluvium uh, which you know in any kind of stress you're going to develop something called a telogen effluvium uh, which is quite common even after typhoid so it's going to be a non scarring type of alopecia only and it's going to respond well to treatment and second is the oral ulcers and if you want to know the features of the oral ulcers which are very very important for exams one feature if you want to know that these oral ulcers are extremely painless so which means uh, if you get an after ulcer that's going to be taking your life away it's going to be excruciatingly painful whereas the oral ulcers that you're going to get in the setting of systemic lupus erythematosus are absolutely painless and the most common location where you're going to get this oral ulcers is going to be on the palate rather than the buccal mucosa usually palatal after ulcers are very very rare you will get mostly in the buccal mucosa but sle related oral ulcers are going to be more in the palate rather than the buccal mucosa and there will be more erythematous than after after ulcers will have a white base it's a necrotic base whereas ulcers that happen in the setting of sle will have a erythematous base it will be red in color that's how it's going to be and next we have the skin manifestations of systemic lupus erythematosus that is cutaneous manifestations of sle so remember the uh, cutaneous sle itself is a separate topic and it's a matter of debate we have a lot of uh, varieties of skin manifestations typically we're going to call it as something called a cutaneous lupus erythematosus and one very 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 important point that you have to note is the fact that cutaneous lupus erythematosus is not equal to systemic lupus erythematosus which means a patient with cutaneous lupus erythematosus may or may not have systemic lupus erythematosus or a patient who is having systemic lupus erythematosus may or may, may not have a cutaneous lupus erythematosus so most of the times sle and cle will be together but it's not always that sle and cle has to be together so there can be a lot of variations as well so let us discuss only uh, the cutaneous lupus erythematosus right now which may or may not be associated with underlying systemic lupus erythematosus we have basically three different types of cutaneous lesions one is going to be the acle called as acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus second one we are going to call it as sce that's called subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus third we have something called as ccle that's called a chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus so acle on the other hand can be further divided into two one is called a localized acle the classic example of a localized acle is your typical malar rash that butterfly shaped rash that you see even though in indians you don't see the classic butterfly shaped which is very common in westerners or it could be a generalized uh acle or acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus or they even have a third kind of presentation which is very rare that's called a 10 like presentation what do you mean by 10 this is called a toxic epidermolysis um i mean necrolysis type of presentation uh top to to i mean uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis type of presentation that's called a 10 so 10 like presentation also is there in the setting of acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus there are two types of lesions one is called a annular type of lesion second one is the papulosquamous type of lesions and chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus you have multiple different uh, types of ccle for example the most important of all is going to be the dle that's what is going to be the exam question that's called a discoid lupus erythematosus and apart from that uh, you have uh, the paniculitis lupus paniculitis that's called also called as lupus profundus then we have uh, the lupus timidus and uh, you have another one called as a chilblain lupus chilblain lupus i mean these are very rare to be asked in exams and even in dle you have many many different types like hypertrophic generalized localized mucosal many different types of dle are there but no need to confuse too much as an undergrad level so let us just keep it very simple and see what are the differences between this uh, three types of uh, uh, cutaneous lupus that is acle sle and ccle so if you ask me the association with sle acle is going to have the maximum association with sle more than 90% of acle patients will have underlying systemic lupus erythematosus but only 50% of sle patients will have underlying systemic lupus erythematosus but whereas only 5 to 30% of uh, 
CCLE patients, especially in the setting of discoid lupus erythematosus, will be having underlying systemic lupus erythematosus. Then let us move on to the clinical features after knowing the association with SLD. Clinical features are uh, going to be the malar rash, which is going to be the most important. We know uh, what is the classic description of a malar rash. Let me tell you, I'm not going to write and waste time on it because it's something very simple and every single undergrad should know. So malar rash is basically going to have an erythema in the malar region, which is nothing but the cheeks and the nose. And of course, it's going to be bilaterally symmetrical which is going to produce a classic butterfly shape and it's going to spare these nasolabial folds. You know, what are the nasolabial folds? You have uh, the side of the nose. So we have the nasolabial fold. So that area is going to be spared. That's really, really, really important because there is a close differential diagnosis for something called uh, rosacea where you will have involvement of the nasolabial folds. So that's why that in non-involvement or the nasolabial folds are spared. That point is really, really important in the setting of a mala rash in the setting of SLE. And more importantly, this acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus lesions generally tend to heal without scarring. They don't scar. Heal without scarring. They don't have any problems at all. On the other hand, if you have this kind of... Uh, Subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, uh, they are going to have an annular or papuloscamous lesion. These type of lesions are basically called as psoriaform type of lesions. Why they are called psoriaform type of lesions? Because they can produce a small amount of scaling, not a very vigorous psoriatic amount of scaling. That's why it's called a psoriaform, but it's a small amount of scaling is possible. And uh, these lesions also tend to heal without scarring. So generally they are going to be annular, polycyclic, heterocyclic so you can see this kind of lesions erythematous lesions in the trunk in the body in many areas especially in the sun exposed areas and uh, they can coil us together and form various uh, you know like uh, shapes like this as well and they, they also heal without scarring and they don't generally scar they heal without a scar but one important thing is the fact they may leave out something called a residual hyperpigmentation sorry residual hypopigmentation they can leave out something called a residual hypopigmentation when they leave. But the most important difference with that of the other two from chronic cutaneous lupus erythematis is the fact that they really scar and they can disfigure you and they can produce a lot of uh, ugly disfiguration which is clearly possible. So they are going to heal with a scar, scar formation. So of course you have to know about uh, the characteristic features of DLE that is discoid lupus erythematosus. If somebody asks you what is the most common location of discoid lupus erythematosus, I am going to answer it is going to be the face. Like how ACLE uh, very commonly happens in the face in the form of a malar rash. Similarly discoid lupus erythematosus the most common location is also going to be the face. And uh, it can happen in the scalp sometimes. So that is why it will lead to something called a scarring alopecia. But remember the most common type of alopecia in SLE is going to be non-scarring due to telogen effluvium. But if it is a DLE related alopecia then uh, it can result in a scarring type of alopecia which really scars. And how the lesion is going to be? Lesion is going to be like this, a rounded lesion. Uh, in the center you will have, I do not know, I do not have the pink color here. In the center you might have the pinkish discoloration with scarring and on top of the scars in the center you will have this scales so this green which i'm drawing is going to be the scales which is present on the top of the lesion and uh, below that there will be a scar uh, that's already there and uh, on the outside you will have the active erythematous that's why i put it in red so this edge is the one that's going to keep expanding slowly over a period of time so clear so you basically you can remove these scars I mean, remove the scales. So when you put a knife underneath and you just tack it out, uh, uh, the scales and you uh, put the scales upside down. And if you see these scales, what really the scales are made of. So you can see that these scales will contain a lot of dot-like structures. And these dot-like structures are nothing but keratin plugs, which are very, very classic. These keratin plugs on the back of the, you know, like scales that you have, teared off or uh, removed from the discoid lupus erythematous rash uh, and the appearance is what we refer to as a carpet tag. And I, I hope everyone would have seen a carpet tag in uh, weddings or any functions where they used to fix the carpet to the wooden surface. So they put some tags. So these are what we call as carpet tag sign. So they look like that carpet tag. So that's why it's called a carpet tag sign. 
So this is a very classical feature of a discoid lupus erythematous, the carpet tag sign and it's highly, highly, highly scarring and uh, there's no escape from that. And basically when you want to do a biopsy from this uh, lesion, you're going to see something called a KFC, which is a multiple times asked question. So what is the KFC that you're going to see? So K stands for keratotic scaling and uh, EF stands for follicular plugging, which is going to be the most, 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 most important. And C stands for cutaneous atrophy. Typically, the dermal atrophy will be there. So, we can call it as a cutaneous atrophy, which is nothing but an atrophy in the local area. So, we know the different three types of uh, cutaneous lupus erythematosus. One is the ACLE, second is going to be the SCLE, and third one is going to be the CCLE, chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. And out of all this, if you want to know a very, very important uh, antibody association, so, for example, ACLE does not have much of antibody association. CCLE also does not have much of antibody association. But this SCLE has a very, very strong association with one important antibody. Can anyone tell what antibody is actually associated with uh, subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus? Anyone? So, I'll wait for a couple of minutes. If anyone is going to tell what antibody is going to be associated with subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus. No one till now. So no one is about to tell. Okay, so let me tell the right answer. Antibody that is associated with the subacute goodness lupus erythematosus is anti SSA. So otherwise referred to as anti rho antibodies. Anti rho antibodies are the ones that will be really associated with this uh, subacute goodness lupus erythematosus. So fine. So we have understood this. So after uh, knowing about this uh, various type of cutaneous lupus erythematosus, let us move on to the other problems. For example, SLE itself might have something called a vascular disease with the force manifestation. Vascular disease in SLE. So beyond all these things, first of all, you have to understand the fact that all the skin lesions, including ACLE, including SCLE, including CCLE, all of these skin lesions are extremely photosensitive and they can be aggravated with exposure to sunlight or any form of UV light. So they are extremely photosensitive. And if suppose somebody asks you what is the uh, lesion that is having maximal photosensitivity in the setting of SLE, I'll be answering it is lupus timidus. So this is the one that's going to have the maximum photosensitivity among all the cutaneous lesions in SLE, especially the CLE part, the cutaneous lupus erythematosus. Then let us move on to the Vascular disease, as I told you, vascular disease, if they ask you what is the most common vascular component of uh, lupus erythematosus, I will be going for Raynaud's phenomenon, such a common entity like Cleroderma where Raynaud's is extremely common. Apart from that, uh, they can produce vasculitis, they can produce uh, thromboembolic features. Remember, thromboembolic features is a natural phenomenon in the setting of SLE. Thromboembolism is natural because uh, SLE is a disease, it's going to be very damaging to the vessels. So, thromboembolism is a very natural thing that happens in SLE. I mean, SLE itself is a risk factor for developing thromboembolism and uh, vascular issues. But if you have APLA antibodies, for example, this antiphospholate antibodies in SLE, presence of this APLA antibodies is going to increase the risk multiple times, thromboembolic risk. And if at all you will get a vasculitis, it's always going to be a small vessel vasculitis and not a large vessel or medium vessel vasculitis. SLE typically tends to produce a small vessel vasculitis. Most common presentation of this vasculitis is the skin lesions that you see, especially in the form of probably a palpable purpura like lesion. Then if they ask you in the cardiac perspective, what is the most common cardiac manifestation? The answer is going to be your uh, pericarditis. Pericarditis is going to be the most common cardiac manifestation in the setting of SLE. And uh, of course, myocarditis can happen, but it's not... Uh, very common it's uh, relatively rare the setting of SLE but they can produce uh, something called endocarditis and SLE generally tend to produce a sterile form of endocarditis which means it's not an infectious form of endocarditis and this kind of uh, sterile endocarditis is basically called as 
Lipman Sachs endocarditis, which is very, very important for exams. You would have studied since your second year pathology. We called as Lipman Sachs endocarditis as LSE. It's a type of NBT only, that is non uh, bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. If at all they ask you the most common valve that is involved in, uh, in the Lipman Sachs endocarditis is going to be the mitral valve, then followed by the tricuspid valve, but the most common valve is always going to be the mitral valve. And uh, what is the clinical feature? Most of the times they tend to be asymptomatic, they don't have any problems. Uh, they have a little bit of association with one important antibody called uh, antiphospholipid antibodies which are very important for exams there is an association with apla how your uh, subacute goodness lupus erythematosus is having association with uh, anti ro antibodies similar to that your lipman sacs endocarditis has small association with apla antibodies and trauma embolism also has a strong association with antiphospholipid antibodies and uh, they affect the healthy valve that's really important remember there is a major difference between uh, infected endocarditis where infective endocarditis typically affects your uh, diseased valve. We know that. So, like for example, a mitral regurgitation, there will be a diseased valve. So, infective endocarditis typically involves a diseased valve. But whereas uh, in the setting of uh, Lipman Sachs endocarditis, it's going to affect the healthy valve. And they don't have any side preference. They can uh, uh, involve both the sides of the valve, which is different from. Uh, infective endocarditis but let us see the difference so i don't want to confuse you more so let us see the difference between infective endocarditis vegetation and non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis vegetation which is typically seen in the setting of mucinous adenocarcinomas from gat and pancreas and uh, what will happen in the setting of a libman sachs endocarditis which happens in sle so what is the valve that is affected remember infective endocarditis typically involves the diseased or damaged valve previously and non-bacterial thrombotic uh, endocarditis is going to affect the healthy valves and uh, Lipman Sachs endocarditis of course they are going to affect the healthy valves they are not going to have any prior uh, you know, like valvular disease vegetation size the size of the vegetations is absolutely variable but typically they tend to produce the conglomeration or the uh, you know like aggregation of small small vegetations to become huge large and friable vegetations so these are called as large and friable vegetations, which means uh, they are going to embolize very, very rapidly if you don't treat them, high risk of embolism. That's why I'm writing the name large conglomeration or aggregation of multiple vegetations and they're going to be absolutely friable, which means their capacity to embolize is going to be very, very, very high. And apart from that, uh, NBT on the other hand, uh, Vegetations are generally tend to be small, less than one centimeter usually, made of uh, clots, that is platelet and fibrin most of the times. Whereas LSE, uh, you know, like vegetations are tend to be a little medium in size. So medium sized vegetations are seen in uh, Lipman Sachs endocarditis. Location as such is concerned. So usually you will be having on the valve cusps, especially on the tip of the valve, at the site of the closure, that's where you're going to see the vegetation, the setting of infected endocarditis. And... Uh, more often on the atrial surface rather than the ventricular surface atrial surface rather than the ventricular surface that's where you're going to see which means if you are going to see a, a mitral valve infect into cardiac vegetation most of the time it will be on the tip of the mitral valve and on the same time it will be on the top portion that is towards the atrial side not on the ventricular side on the other hand uh, your uh, NBT vegetations are going to be seen along the lines of closure. Once again, more on the atrial side than the ventricular side. But on the other hand, your Lipman Sachs endocarditis will not have any preferential location. They can be seen on both the sides of the valve. So both sides of the valve, you can see the vegetations. But uh, preferentially seen on the ventricular surface more than the atrial surface. That's where it is different. No side preference and it will be seen more on the ventricular surface than on the atrial surface. For example, if you take a mitral valve, sorry, maybe a tricuspid valve, where you have three uh, cusps. So if you want to know where the vegetations will be, usually the vegetations will be a large vegetation, which will be seen on the tip of the valve, which will be seen on the tip of the valve, uh, and it will be friable and will be more seen on the atrial surface rather than the ventricular surface. On the other hand, if you take your NBT, NBT on the other hand, it will be seen on the line of closure. So very commonly, it will be seen along the lines of closure. 
but once again it will be seen more on the atrial side compared to the ventricular side but a small vegetation not a big vegetation if you take the third one that is the lipman sacs endocarditis there is no preference anywhere they can be seen anywhere and on the both sides they tend to be medium sized and uh, you know like they i mean you can see anywhere so both sides of the valve both atrial as well as ventricular but uh, they generally tend to have a preferential involvement of the ventricular side of the valve rather than the atrial side of the valve so whether you see any signs of inflammation inflammatory signs will be seen or not inflammatory signs yes of course fever is very very important in the setting usually don't see any inflammatory signs it may be there or may not be there in the setting of uh, your lipman sacs endocarditis culture sensitivity of course it will be positive very very important criteria that duke's criteria positive cultures and you don't have any positive culture in the setting of uh, nbt or lipman sacs endocarditis because they are sterile vegetations and embolization embolization risk is extremely common and maximum with the infected endocarditis vegetation because uh, they are very large and they are going to be absolutely friable whereas embolization risk is still there in the setting of uh, uh, nbt but not like infected endocarditis vegetations but uh, embolization risk is extremely rare so very very uncommon you don't really get embolization in the setting of uh, you know like lipman sacs endocarditis okay so we have seen about the cardiac manifestations skin manifestations and uh, we have seen about the uh, mucocutaneous manifestations and musculoskeletal manifestations now we will close down the session for this time with the pulmonary manifestations then after this we will move on to the uh, because i have another youtube session scheduled for you maybe uh, day after tomorrow of that so where i'll be discussing the remaining portions of sla and the remaining uh, manifestations of sla of which the lupus nephrite is going to be the most important so this is going to be a uh, continuation so of two three two to three youtube sessions on systemic lupus erythematosus anyways fine so as far as the pulmonary features are concerned the pleuritis is going to be the most common we know that zero set is a very very important feature in sle almost uh, 50 to 70 percentage of the patients will have pleuritis and pleurisy and chest pain because of that and this can result in pleural effusion and more importantly they'll in exam they'll be asking you about uh, rheumatoid arthritis related pleural effusion and SLE related to and how you are going to differentiate between them and uh, in both these settings you will be having certain common features in both these settings it likely tends to be an exudate you know what are the characteristic features of exudate by lights criteria but there are some differences as well the rheumatoid arthritis plural effusions tend to be little large collections whereas SLE efficients tend to be very small and rheumatoid arthritis plural effusions are known to have extremely low glucose we know that one of the characteristic effusions with such a low glucose less than 60 less than 40 less than 30 is rheumatoid arthritis where um, sle efficients tend to have a normal glucose or probably only a mild decline in the glucose that's what i'm going to see in the setting of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus related plural effusion and both are hypo complementemic which means in the effusion if you test for the complement there will be low complements because of the immunological reaction that is happening and the complements may be consumed in the immune reaction so that you won't see that much of complements in this perspective and uh, apart from that uh, you can um, get other uh, pulmonary features in the setting of sle like probably you can get pneumonitis or you can get uh, interstitial lung disease all right pneumonitis and interstitial lung disease pneumonitis is not that common but acute pneumonitis is going to be a life-threatening problem and you can get ild so both are basically rare but very importantly ild you have to know it's very very rare in the setting of sle less than three to five percentage of the cases will not be more than that which means it's not a very common entity if a disease presents with ild in the first place think about uh, other problems apart from sle like probably a uh, scleroderma or a, I mean uh, your mixed conduit tissue disorder or uh, some other disease that produces ILD. So SLE does not usually present with ILD most of the time. It's a very rare finding. If at all they develop ILD, the most common type of ILD is of course going to be the NSIP. Except promoted arthritis, most of the conduit tissue disorders are going to produce the non-specific interstitial pneumonia only. That is NSIB. And SLE can produce diffuse alar hemorrhage and SLE can produce something called a shrinking lung syndrome that is called a sls where uh, because of the neuromuscular damage in the setting of sle the myositis will happen the diaphragmatic and intercostal myositis will happen in sle because of that uh, the recoil force might be very poor i mean very much compared to that of the 
uh, you know like uh, external force from the chest wall so that the lung might recoil back because of the poor muscles which might result in a appearance of a small lung called as shrinking lung syndrome and more importantly the shrinking lung syndrome is associated with anti rho antibodies once again so and because anti rho antibodies can produce myositis they can produce the diaphragmatic and intercostal myositis which is supposed to be the reason for the development of this uh, shrinking lung syndrome clear so there are certain areas where we discuss certain antibodies for example we have discussed uh, on the subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus where we told this anti rho antibodies are very important and for augmenting the photosensitivity enhancing the photosensitivity in SLE once again your anti rho antibodies are very important and apart from that uh, for thromboembolic features SLE itself is a risk factor for thromboembolism but definitely applies a very high risk and it increases the positive risk multiple times and development of Lipman Sachs endocarditis anti rho once again and development of this shrinking lung syndrome anti rho once again so we have seen four features of anti rho now photosensitivity subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus Lipman Sachs endocarditis and shrinking lung syndrome and we have seen I mean antibody for your uh, trauma embolic features that is your apply antibodies which are very 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 important for the development of uh, trauma embolism so fine so we have discussed certain clinical features of SLE in this particular session so in the part 2 session wait for it so within a couple of days i'm going to schedule a part 2 session in that we'll be discussing the remaining clinical features of systemic lupus erythematosus including the most important renal manifestation blood manifestation skin manifestation and ocular manifestation SLE and after that in the part 3 we'll be discussing on the investigations and diagnosis in the part 4 we'll be discussing on the treatment options that are available for systemic lupus erythematosus so stay tuned so i'm going to discuss more on sle in the future so with this let me sign off from this particular video and hope you enjoyed the session thank you very much bye bye